deal with public ministry. <clears throat> what it actually is, and I've actually divided it down to three different things. Uh, let me start at the bottom. Let's we'll start with church ministry. Uh, and that's what most, you know, people are familiar with, or at least, and I'm talking about the Christian people, uh, uh, the ministry in the church. A church ministry, that's any attempt to preach or teach the Word of God in a church or a church-sponsored setting. I oh, like the service of a rescue mission, nursing home, jail, etc. And that's what most people who are doing anything, that's what they're doing. And, and you know, it's sort of safe here in the four walls of, uh, uh, of a church building or, you know, nobody's mad at you, going to throw rocks at you. So, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm like anybody else. I don't like folks, you know, cussing at me and being mad at me and whatnot. And that's just human nature is that, you know, you want to avoid conflict. What do you say about the children of Israel when they came out of... Uh, the land of Egypt, he, he didn't take them through the way of the Philistines, unless when they see war, they get weary, turn around and go back to Egypt. And there's a natural aversion that people have to conflict. You don't like to, you know, I don't like some guy getting in my face and, and blah, 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 you know, and, and whatnot. So when you're ministering inside a church building, you know, it's mostly safe people, uh, you, you feel a little safer, and that's where that's why that's what most people do if they're going to do anything. Then you got private, what I call private ministry. That's an attempt to witness privately to a specific person or persons, usually a setting like home, workplace, or school. What they call one-on-one -on -one evangelism, door-to-door uh, -door visitation, uh, so forth, and and that is taught in the Word of God uh, that you go publicly and from house to house. Um, that seems to be the one that uh, uh, a lot of people put an emphasis on uh, in, in the fundamental independent free will the old King James Bible Baptist Church of today is personal one-on-one -on -one evangelism. That's what I like. You know, that, that's what they'll tell you. But, you know, the street ministry, the street preaching, and, and we'll get some of the objections today as to why they don't. And like I say, the Bible does teach that. We have we have three visitation programs in our church, uh, Monday night, Thursday morning, and, and a Saturday morning, plus our bus visitation. So there is that where you're doing that. But that's where you're, you're going specifically to see some specific person or in their home. It's, it's going to be a, sort of a one-on-one -on -one evangelism. But did you know that the book of Acts really... 90% of what it deals with is public ministry. Uh, Acts chapter 2. Uh, was it 3,000 people get saved? You don't get 3,000 people saved in the upper room. And they're in the room. They obviously must have gotten out onto the street when the Spirit of God came on. Uh, Peter and James and uh, or John in uh, Acts chapter 3. They're going down to the temple to pray. Uh, and then uh, they, they heal this guy. And now there's a big crowd around. They're out, it's publicly. Um, Acts chapter uh, 7, where Stephen's up before the Sanhedrin, that's really a public ministry. Public ministry is not necessarily just on the street. Uh, I've done public ministry in front of the county commission, uh, at, a, at an open county commission meeting, uh, where there's a packed room, and you get two minutes to get up and say something. And so that, that is public. See, I'm, I'm doing it to a bunch of folks there. That's what Stephen, he's up in front of the Sanhedrin, big crowd around there, and, and he's testifying uh, out to him. Philip goes down to Samaria, and he preaches Christ up to him. There wasn't any church down there to go to. He's probably out publicly on the street like he is with that Ethiopian. Now, sometimes the uh, folks will use the Ethiopian eunuch as an example of one-on-one -on -one evangelism, but stop thinking for a minute. The Ethiopian fella is a high government official who has traveled up to Jerusalem. High government officials do not travel by themselves. He's probably got an entourage with him, the guards and the secretaries and all the rest of them. While Philip's up there dealing with this guy in the chariot and everybody else is, is sort of listening in. So again, that's public. And then of course the Apostle Paul all through uh, the rest of the book of Acts. He's down there on Mars Hill. He's preaching to them. It's a, it's a public setting um, over and over again. So the last one is the public ministry. Any attempt to witness by preaching, singing, testifying, giving out printed material, gospel tracts, holding scripture signs, banners, wearing scripture clothing. Hey, when you walk into Walmart, you got a shirt on the back that says Jesus saves. 
that's public ministry. I've got a whole bunch of these things, that, and we put a verse of scripture on the back of every one of them. When I go into Walmart, uh, you know, I don't, and I don't know how many people have come around and said, oh, I like your shirt. Or you go to Smyrna Baptist Church, you know, so it's a great opportunity. We had one, believe it or not, we were in Ryan's Restaurant eating, one of my favorite places. And uh, another brother from the church, he and his wife were there, I happened to meet them, we were standing there talking. And Rick had one of his shirts on, and this guy walked up and said, uh, I like your shirt. He said, can I ask you a question? Says, uh, what does that mean? He must be born again. Well, uh, amen. And but Rick was on him just like that. And uh, right there in the restaurant, he told me how to be saved. And so, great opportunity there. Uh, bumper stickers, anything like that. Anywhere where you're in a public setting, to whosoever might be there. Uh, when you're down on the street, that's public ministry. You preach on a street corner, that's public ministry. So uh, we're going to deal with some of the objections to, uh, now if you got any questions or comments along the way, feel free to jump in and ask for anything I want. But these are, the, these are the things you run into as to why people, you know, say you shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Some of these are objections raised by lost people, and some are by professing Christians. Okay? Uh, so first one I got down here. How many of you have heard? It doesn't do any good. Right? <laughs> How many of you heard that? So why are you people out here? Nobody's listening to you. I used to say something, well, you must have been listening to me because you came up to talk to me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and of course their idea is if you're not converting the majority of the people that are, are out there, then you're a flop. Yeah. But that isn't, you know, I'm not looking for the majority to get to. The majority is always going to reject the, the truth. Uh, I've got the example there of no. According to their definition of success, Noah was a flop. Right. Right. Uh, as far as I can tell, it says that you know that his days would be at 120 years. Uh, so Noah preached, I guess, for 120 years. He started Brother Black with 10 people in his church. Him, his wife, his three boys, their three wives, his daddy, and his granddaddy. And the daddy and granddaddy died, and nobody else got converted. Okay. Yeah. Yep. A failure. You and I wouldn't be here if he hadn't done that. I mean, uh, so they say, well, it doesn't do any good. Well, you know, matter of opinion. In fact, uh, somebody, uh, let me get you a look. Somebody read me 11, uh, Hebrews 11, 7. And somebody get me 2 Timothy 4, 2. Now, Noah was a success in this sense. Who had Hebrews? 11, 7. By faith, Noah, being born of God, things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. All right. Those are the phrase there. He condemned the world. His men now. I don't like to think, because, you know, I, I tend to think as much as I can positively, you know, I've been praying, I said, Lord, somewhere down on Beale Street, there is somebody I can talk to, somebody that I can reach with the gospel. I'd like to see somebody get saved. I'd like to lead somebody to Christ down there. But uh, I realize the majority of it's not going to be that way. Uh, everybody who I deal with on Beale Street, everybody that you deal with will make a decision. Everyone. They may decide to receive Christ as Savior or to save or repent of their sin, or they may make a decision not to. But every one of them makes a decision. And at the white throne judgment, these unsaved people come up there because of the fact that you've been out there on the street, whether here at Beale Street in your hometown or whatever, uh, and, and they saw a verse of scripture, they saw somebody preaching, whatever, uh, they get there at the white throne judgment and they say, well, I never heard it. I didn't know. I really <coughs> believe it. I mean, it says the books were open. God has recorded everything that ever went on in that person's life. And I believe you're in eternity there. God, they got all the time in the world. I think God, I think God will say, all right, tell me about it. Tell me. He said, well, I never heard of the gospel. Angels flip over that page there. March 14th, 2007.
You were down there on Beale Street. And it seems to me that you were walking along and somebody said, can I give you something to read? And you looked at it and you saw a cross on there and you said, no thank you. No. I want that trash. Or you were walking along and uh, some of them was standing there, some girl was standing there with a, with a banner and it said, Christ died for your sins according to the scripture. And you said, man, I'm down here a party. I'm not that. And all that will come back at the white throne judgment. Let God be true, but every man a liar. And I think, I think God will play back some of the foolishness that has gone on down there on, on Beale Street. I, I'm sure you all have had this happen. Uh, that girl went down, down there, standing there with a banner, and she comes up and she turned around. Some friends are going to take her picture in front of this banner. I, I, those banners I got there are all kinds of Facebook pages and everything else all over this world. And basically, she stripped herself right there. I think that the white throne of judgment. Sir, good God. All right, young lady, let's play it through again now before the entire universe. The angels, the seraphim, the cherubim, the archangel. Let's play that back again and see how funny it is now. So, in a way, uh, you say, well, it doesn't do any good. Well, I'm called to go down there whether or not, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. So, uh, 2 Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. So I will, you know, when somebody tells me, I say, well, it doesn't do any good. I was something like, well, hey, you're here, you're listening, so uh, it must be doing something good. Um, now this one, now this one, I'll have some of the, uh, the brethren throw out at you. Well, does anybody get saved? And sometimes now, down at, how many of you, how many of you have led somebody to Christ down on Beale Street? Or you said, well, you said, yeah. Now, did we have 500 saved down here? No. But every year, every time, we will have half a dozen, a dozen folks who, who get saved and, uh, and uh, whatnot. But of course, they're talking about situations like maybe where you're preaching on a traffic light. I have yet to have anybody put the brake on, climb out of their car, run over there, fall down, defend their sin, get saved right there. And we have to get some stop and hold up traffic. Uh, you know, obviously we're listening, but say, does anybody get saved? And they'll use that as a reason not to go out and, and, uh, and uh, do public ministry. Well, uh, if you look in Acts chapter 17, verse 34, Paul's preaching there on Mars Hill at Areopagus, and it said, uh, when they heard of the resurrection, what? Some mocked. Others said, we'll hear thee again of this matter. But certain claim unto Paul and believe, and then he gives the name of a, of a couple of folks there. So yes, people do get saved. Uh, public ministry. We talked to one of the fellows in our church who was uh, out driving around on Saturday. The guy from uh, Pensacola Bible Institute were out there preaching on the corner and he pulled up there and this fellow came up and was preaching and, and he said, I could tell right away he was not from somewhere in the deep south. He said, you know, uh, it's a, it's a, the boy sat on the bridge and you know, and I, he said, where are you from? He said, uh, oh, I said, I'm from Brooklyn. I said, well, that's good. He said, uh, he said I'm down here going to school. He said, uh, uh, when did you get saved? How did you get saved? He said, I got saved at a street meeting just like this. I was preaching on the street corner up in Brooklyn. And he said, I stopped and listened. He said, <coughs> So there are some people who do trust Christ, and uh, I sometimes will throw this back. At, uh, I'm not trying to be ugly, but I said, well, does anybody get saved at these meetings you have? I said, well, you know, we get a few, and I said, uh, let me ask you, I'm just trying to, I'm not being ugly, but how many folks have gotten saved in your church in the last year? And you know most about it, most of them. I mean, you know, I remember in the 60s when you had a revival, and of course they all lasted about a week, if you didn't see three or four adults saved, there was something wrong with the meeting. I mean, every meeting that we ever had. Now, if you have a revival meeting and some adult gets saved, it's almost, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And we, we had one saved in this meeting and, and uh, whatnot. So uh, there are fundamental independent Baptist churches all over America who in a year's time, maybe one or two will walk down the aisle for the first time to see Right, so I don't know that you know, we're having any more or less than, uh, than what the rest of them do. And then, of course, I can take the example. Old Stephen, 
Stephen's up there before the Sanhedrin, and whether they haul him out there and stone him and whatnot, and I imagine as the stones are flying and his last breath going out, I've heard one preacher preach about Stephen's. Goes on to be with the Lord. The Lord said, Well, welcome home, Stephen. He said, <coughs> trip coming in here. And he said, uh, Sure didn't have anything happen down at that meeting. And he said, Well, you don't know all the results yet. Because there's a fellow by the name of uh, Saul there. And he's holding the, the garments of the folks who were throwing stones. Well, how'd you like to have one copper like Paul? Amen. And, uh, but he didn't know that. And so, uh, but yeah, folks do get saved. But sometimes, like I say, I've had people ask me that. Say, do you have anybody saved over there at, uh, you stand out there on the street? Well, I didn't have this week, but hey, I'm supposed to get out and preach the word regardless. Um, and then this is another one that you'll hear from, uh, uh, from particularly uh, Christian people. Does it, it doesn't get anybody into the church. Now, some folks have a mentality that everything has to be based on, you know, how many folks you get into that local church and whether or not attendance is, is, you know, going up. And if it's not, then, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a flop. And uh, that's, you know, that is why there are, are I believe, Baptist churches who do not, do not support missions. Because in their mind, it doesn't get anybody into our church. So why should I be trying to, you know, do things out there? We had a fellow one year, uh, we, we do a lot of parades around Christmas time in the Pensacola area. Great opportunity to get out there and uh, you, know, you can have a float with banners all over it, give out gospel tracts. And we're going to go down to Fort Walton Beach, which is about 35 miles away. And one fellow said, How come we're going down there? He said, Anybody that you know, we deal with down there, they're not going to come to church here. I said, Well, that's true. <coughs> For the same reason we support foreign missionaries in Japan and China. And he said, Man, yeah, I guess you're right there. So it isn't just a matter of whether you get somebody in. Uh, and of course, I would tell them, well, they get saved, they get in the Lord's church, amen. And the Bible says in Acts 2 47, the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. And of course, it's talking there about the body of Christ. So you'll get some folks that'll, you know, they have this mentality that, that everything is this church growth. And, and let's say I'm, I'm a local church man, I believe in, in uh, support of the local church. I've been a member of an independent Baptist church for since I got saved almost. And, uh, and uh, every, all, a lot, almost everything I do is through our local independent Baptist church. But just because, hey, we go down to the rescue mission. We have a, a rescue mission service every month. Most of those guys, I'm never going to get into, right. uh, you know, Smyrna Baptist Church. They just, they're coming through town. They'll be gone. But hey, they got a soul. And I'm, we're trying to reach them with the gospel. And so uh, you don't just do it just because, you know, it get it into my particular church and if it doesn't then you know forget about it. Uh, most of y'all how, how many of y'all are out of town? <coughs> I mean if you lead folks to Christ down here on Beale Street, they're not gonna get you into over in uh Bolivar, Tennessee or Pensacola, Florida or wherever you're from. Uh, you're doing it because you're gonna preach the word, the instant in season out of season and so forth. So but you will hear that objection enough from time. Here's one I hear quite often. It looks dumb. You know how dumb you all look? And I'm thinking, you know how dumb you look? <laughs> I mean, this guy's standing there, he's got this gallon of beer with a whizzy straw that he's sucking this thing through. He's kind of, you know, like this. He's got this right to turn around back. And, he, and of course, they all now got Alabama uh, shirts on because, you know, it, 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 that, that crowd, whoever wins the, the, uh, the NCAA, you know, they, they've got an Alabama shirt, they got an Auburn shirt, they got an LSU shirt, and whoever wins, they dig that one out and wear it out. And I'm thinking, you, you're not even from Alabama, you don't know anybody down there, you know, you don't know anybody down there. You, you think I look like Alabama. But how many of you had that time I tell you, man, you look dumb standing out here. I won that guy down there one year, he said, he said, this is about, y'all about the queerest bunch of Oh God, I've seen mine now. I hope it wasn't anything like you know that, but uh, <coughs> just to them it does, and uh, to the unsaved people it does look dumb. Uh, and I've got a, a couple of verses there. First Corinthians one eighteen says, "For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish what foolishness. foolishness. It's duh. You know what? What are y'all down here?" 
looks dumb. Yep, it does. I did that. Uh, somebody read me Mark 3.21. This is, this is, never looked at that verse. What it says. They thought Jesus was dumb. In fact, they thought Jesus had lost his mind. They thought he'd been out in the sun too long. Yes, sir. Mark 3.21. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. But they said, he is beside himself. When not his enemies, his friends. When Jesus' friends saw all that he was doing, they said they went out to lay hold on him. You know what that means? That means they're going to get you by the arm and let's, let's get you out of here. You, they said he is beside himself. You know, what that, you know what that means? When you're beside yourself, you're standing here, and you're beside yourself. You're schizo. You're, you're split. You're, but you, you, you're nuts. And there are unsafe people who think, you know, you're standing down here on Beale Street, man. You, you got these <coughs> banners and, <coughs> and all these girls look like they dressed from 100 years ago, you know. I mean, what's, what's the matter with y'all? Well, yeah, we do look dumb. And you look dumb to us, too. I don't want to tell them that, but, uh, So you will have that, uh, that one come up. Now, here's one that uh, unsafe always uses. You're judging us. And I, I guess the most well-known verse among the unsaved people is, Judge not! Judge not, that you be, lest you be judged. I've offered $100 to any of them to find that folk in the Bible. I haven't given away $100 yet. They don't even know where the verse is. I said, oh, that's not a Bible verse. Yeah, it is. It's in the Bible. I said, show it to me. Give you $100 to me. I haven't parted with any money yet. Uh, you know, there's a similar verse there in Matthew, but you're judging us. Yes, in a sense, I guess we are. Did you know who the first street preacher historically in the Bible was? First public ministry street preacher. Jonah? No, we'll go way in the Old Testament. Before the flood. Eh, I don't read anything about Abel. Yeah. Enoch. Enoch. Jude. Uh, uh, Jude chapter, or the book of Jude, <coughs> 14 and 15. Uh, where it talks about Enoch, uh, uh, preached about these, and he said, uh, and he uses the word ungodly in that, those two verses about four or five times. Uh, Reproved ungodly sinners of all their ungodly acts, which they, the ungodly, have ungodly committed. Uh, uh, I think is how the verse goes. I mean, I mean, brother, he's the first guy out there on the street, and he is just giving them down the road. Uh, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they the ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. I mean his, his message is nothing but judgment. And uh, so they say you're judging us. Well not really. I'm just giving you the word of God. In fact the, the other verse that I have there in John 12 it said the word that I've spoken unto you it will judge you in the last day. I'm just, I'm just a messenger. I'm giving you what the Word of God says. And if the God, if the Bible, the Word of God says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a positive and a negative on both sides. We got a guy down in uh, Pensacola. I don't know really what he is. Tell him by the name of Tyler Monk. He's even been on national. And he dresses in a priest outfit. And, and his ministry is to harass street preachers. Uh, and he comes down there. I know him somewhat. And he comes down. And whenever we show up, we'll be down in about three weeks at the big sodomite thing down there. And he shows up with his group. And they stand there and chant, uh, we're glad you're here. And, and I was, it was pitiful. Last year they had a little, about an eight or nine year old girl. And she's up there saying, it's okay to be gay. You were born that way. And I'm thinking, you're 
teaching that eight-year-old child to, you know, uh, to be like that. And, and uh, he says, our biggest problem, he says, you're always condemning everybody. You're always, I said, Tyler, I said, if you listen to me preach, probably 70% of what I preach is Christ died for your sin. You need to be saved. Uh, Jesus Christ shed his blood for your sin. Uh, come to Christ and be saved. 30% uh, of it's probably the other side of it. But his whole message is God loves you and God loves you just the way you are and, and all of that. And so uh, uh, they'll get on you and say, you're, you're judging us. I remember one time about five years ago, we say preach in front of this queer bar called the Emerald City. And uh, the hurricane blew the roof off. So they had to move for a year and they moved to a place down the road and we went down there, and the only place I could stand was right almost in his front door. I mean, it was only a sidewalk, go up this step. I, I mean, I was not plotting it, but trying to, to uh, so I'm standing there, and the rest of the folks had to sort of scatter so that we weren't blocking the sidewalk. And uh, I'm standing there, and in fact, I was talking to the manager, the general manager of this bar, and he and I got to know each other, and and witness to him, he was from a Catholic background and didn't understand the gospel at all. And sad, uh, his name was uh, PR. Uh, and uh, he told me, he said, he was about 40 years old. And he told me, said, Bob, I have to try to get out of this lifestyle. And he said, I can't. I had been married one time. He said, no, tears come down. And he said, I wish I could come out. He said, I can't. And try to witness to him, try to get to him. But he and I were standing there talking and this obviously lesbian woman can't walk up. Now, I've got a verse of scripture that says, God commendeth his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm standing holding this and talking to him. This woman comes up and she looks, and looks at it and she says, so you think I'm going to hell? And then start describing what. And I said, I'm sorry, but this sign here says, God commendeth his love toward us. I said, you must really be under conviction about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. right. And I'd say a verse that just said, God's love is shown to you, but in her mind, <coughs> judge you. And so unsaved people, they'll, they, they, you know, it, 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 you're judging us. All right, next one. This isn't the place for it. How many of you had somebody tell you? Yeah. This isn't the place to be coming down here and bringing religion. Meaning, I came down here to drink a bunch of booze and chase around with these women or whatever and, and, and while you carry on and now you show up with all this Bible and you're getting me nervous and this isn't the place for it. Yeah, keep it in church. See, yeah, keep it in the four walls of the church where I don't have to see it unless I want to go see it and I'm only going to go see it maybe once or twice a year and then I'm going to go someplace where they're not going to tell me anything's wrong with me anyway. <coughs> Don't come down here and get in my face with this, you know, preaching and, and soul winning and, and here, you know, here I'm some woman down there and I'm about half dressed and then all these girls show up and they're really dressed nice and the guys, you know, don't have a, look like a bunch of, as somebody said, a dog that looks like he needs to be fleed and or wormed and dipped and be fleed. <laughs> uh, this is the place for it. Luke 14. You know the parable. Jesus said about the certain man made a supper and he bade many and they began to make excuses. One guy set up all a piece of ground, got to go see him. Next one said, I got uh, four or five ill cocks and got to go prove them. The last one said, I married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Bob Jones Senior got a message on that. He preached and said the first two fellows were stupid. And the last one was handpicked. <laughs> so he says, go out, and he says, go out into the streets and lanes of the city and compel them to come in. And they brought them in. They said, this is all that would come. We went out in the streets and lanes, and they came in. And there's still room. He said, go out into the highways and the hedges. Go out, go down the main road, get off on those dirt roads, anywhere you can. So I'm commanded not to just keep the gospel in the four walls of the church. I have a specific commandment to go on to the streets as in Beale Street and the lanes of the city and I can compel them to come in. So when they say, well, this isn't the place for it. Well, this is the exact 
place for them. Amen. Uh, you know, if you're trying to reach sinners, you go where sinners are. Amen. Amen. So uh, you'll hear that. I've heard this. I, I've heard this one time. And another fellow. <coughs> This isn't your neighborhood or city. What are you doing here? You know, they come in and see the shirt I got. Smyrna Baptist Church, Pensacola, Florida. What are you doing up here in Memphis, Tennessee? And I said, well, where are you from? Well, I'm from over here in uh, Texas. I came here to see all the festivities. Well, that's why I came here too. I came to see you the festivity or herbs, the folks who are going to be here. Uh, I felt uh, we were down, I would say, in front of that sodomite place downtown. And uh, some younger ones came up and they said, uh, you live down here? I said, no, I don't mean, know. It's in north of town. They said, well, this is our neighborhood. What are you doing down here? And I could tell this kid was about, he might have been 18. I said, oh, you, you own a house down here? And he said, well, no, I, I just rent down here. Well, I said, well, I may be your landlord. I said, this must be my neighborhood. This is yours. <laughs> but they get that sort of idea. And we had a fellow down in Pensacola the other day, a uh, Bible Baptist out there preaching. He was at a certain intersection. And two black people <coughs> there. And they said, hey man, said, this is our neighborhood. What you doing here? And he said, well, I'll tell you what. If one of you black fellows want to take this Bible and you want to preach here, so I wouldn't have to be here. <laughs> and so you do get that occasion. How many of you ever had somebody ask you something like that? Tell you, this isn't, this isn't your neighborhood. Or what are you all doing here? You're from out of town or, or whatever. You'll occasionally, you'll, uh, you'll run into that. And of course, uh, I can give him an example of Jonah. He went to Nineveh. Yeah. You talk about not being in his neighborhood. Right. That's 600 miles away. He's a Jew. They're Gentiles. Jews don't have nothing to do with Gentiles. No, uh, he didn't want anything to do with them. And he walks into town and opens his mouth. He doesn't even tell them where he's from, who he is. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. And what he just says, 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. Town where they got converted. Uh, so you'll hear you'll hear that one occasionally. Uh, now this is one. You're hurting my and I got a parenthesis business. You'll get this from some of the business owners down there. Uh, I'm sure Brother Ken, you've had from time to time some of them. And now my approach is if a guy has a legitimate business, something he's not peddling sin, a shoe store, a clothing store. I try to be courteous. I don't preach in front of his doorway. I try to move out. We've got a fellow I preach with a group, uh, Brother Ray Williamson, over in Foley, Alabama. And uh, there's a guy on the southeast corner. He's got kind of a pawn shop, gold buying, whatever. And we, we preach over there for one hour, once a month, uh, about 10 times a year. And his business is about 30 feet down from the corner. And every time he comes out, Stand and you could go try to talk to him. He said, How you doing today? He said, Y'all need to get out of here. I time I talked to him, he said, What is your name? I said, Bob, what's your name? He said, What's your old name? I said, Well, why do you even know? And, uh, and he went on. He said, Yeah, y'all hurt my business. I said, Mister, we're down here one hour a week, one, one hour, one hour a month, and don't even go out here about nine months out of the year. And I said, I've watched, and I don't see that many people going in. I mean, Foley, Alabama is not exactly, you know, downtown not Chicago. Uh, I said, I doubt that we're hurting your business. He said, well, I'm going to call the city council and complain. I said, we're going to have that. Uh, we were preaching over in Milton, Florida one night, and they had the roads under construction. And I didn't even see it, but it was one of those big, you know, flashing, movable road signs they put it said, uh, uh, road narrow, one lane ahead. And I had a van up there, and it was partially in front of that. <coughs> now I had to try not to block street lights and, and that sort of thing. And this guy came by who was with the construction company working on the road. And he said, Hey! Get that thing out in front of that sign! He wasn't even nice. And I looked around and said, what? And he said, you're blocking that side. You're creating a hazard. And I said, Mr. I'm so sorry I didn't realize. Now, probably I was really causing people to see his sign because when they were in my battle, they'd see the sign. So I said, I'll move out of the way. He said, take that sign down now. He said, I want it now. I said, I'll, I'll move. I'm, I'm as far as. He said, you get that sign down or I'm calling the law. I got so I said, you want to call me? I said, I'm calling. A few minutes, the 
police robot and wave and wave, and that was, that was the end of that. <laughs> but you got guys, you know, and then he go by a little later, he was still been out of shape. But I try not to block a man's business, uh, make a nuisance of yourself. I know some here, some of them right down there. And even with a bar, I mean, you know, I'm trying to show them that, but, you know, I don't stand there right and preach right into the front door of the bar. You, you're bordering there on, you know, disturbing the peace or something. Legally, there is a fine line sometimes between breaking the law and not. And so I always try to err a little on the side. But, uh, but now, if it's not a legitimate business, have at it. Like I said, we get out that sodomite thing here in two weeks. I can never say, you're trying to, you're hurting my business. I said, that's exactly what I'm here to do. I said, I'm trying to shut you down. Uh, if you're an adult bookstore, yes, I'm trying to shut this place down. I haven't come over to the abortion thing. I've gone over there and uh, I used to take a scripture sign over there. <coughs> had a great opportunity. I, I, I went to the police lieutenant over there, the abortion workers, a bunch of Catholic folks who show up. And uh, they're having a protest, you know. They were even, they had that little record player <laughs> playing the mass. And they'd all be doing this, you know. And I stand there with my big sign. Little, and they bring these little kids. And the kids pick up that sign and say, Mom, what does that mean there, you know? And I was about, oh, I'll explain that to you. No, no, no. But, um, yeah, I'm trying to shut you down. As far as I'm concerned, this town would be better off without you. Adult bookstore. It's old sleazy bar, the police always have to come down here, some topless folk like that, yeah. If I put you out, but if it's a legitimate business, you know, I don't know you can probably know what I'm talking about, but <laughs> he told me one day, he said, uh, hey, I went out today, he said, uh, I preached in front of a driving range. <laughs> How many of y'all play golf at all? Now golf, you ever watch the, uh, I don't know, you ever, you ever watch one of those tournaments on TV and the announcer talks like this? He says, Man, Tiger Woods is on the Man, it's, there ain't no, woo, come on, Tiger! Because it's concentration. Right. And then that guy's a great one. Kind of, yeah. Now, here's a bunch of guys who paid good money to drive a bucket of balls there in the driveway. About that time, he's like, The Bible says, except the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> to me, you're probably, you know, that, that's not me. I had a friend of mine, he was a missionary to the Philippines. He said he went downtown Pensacola, and there's not a lot of people down there. He was going to preach down that street corner, and he passed out some tracks. And he noticed a big group of people gathering in Caddy Corner in the park. They were there preaching. So he went over there, and there was some school function, you know, like the middle school or something. Boy, he climbed up on his someplace there, and he said, now folks, the Bible says, that, and he said, man, this woman came to run over there. He said, sir, sir, excuse me. He said, I don't, I'm not opposed to what you're doing. He said, we're getting ready to have a, some kind of a meeting or something, a little speech or something for the kids. And, and said, when you're, you know, preaching here, I can't, they can't really hear what, he said, ma'am, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were having something. He said, uh, how long is it going to take you? He said, we'll only be about 15 minutes. He said, I'll stop, and he said, I'll just pass out some tracks, and then when you get done, he said, uh, I'll go ahead and preach. He said, that, sir, I appreciate that. would be fine. So he did. They had their thing. He got done. He didn't and he said, the folks really <coughs> said, I appreciate what you did and whatnot. A little bit of sense. So uh, uh, but sometimes they'll get on, you're hurting my business. But this one, you're going to run into the you. You're interrupting our fun. <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> You know, uh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, you're interrupting my fun. You, you think you think we're interrupting your fun? Go see where Moses came down from Mount Sinai and said the people were uh, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. And when he came down, they're dancing and they're naked. <laughs> Buddy, they have real shindig going on there. And did Moses break up their fun? You bet your bottom dollar. He he cast those things down, broke them, threw it in the brook, and then he made them get down there and drink them. Uh, former pastor, the Lord Julian, said that way back in the 60s, when Barry Goldwater was running for president back in 64, and he was up in Indiana, and he was preaching in a church that had a lot of Union Democrats in it. 
<laughs> and he got up that morning after the morning service, he said, and it was right before the election, he said, tonight I'm going to preach on gold water for the people. He said, man, he said a bunch of those auto workers, <laughs> they came up, they said, well, Rachel, you run up into the politics, and he said, yeah, you just come up. He said, I, I demand to get up afterwards and, and uh, you know, give the other, he said, that's fine. And he preached on that where he took the, uh, uh, the uh, tablets, the uh, two tablets, and he uh, he broke them, and I think they were gold tablets, and he and he strewed them into the water, and he made the people drink of the water. It was gold water for the people. Oh, they, they were, you know, okay. And they came up afterwards and said, "Well, I don't know that's what you're going to do." So, but anyhow, you you'll get that one. Here's one. It's against the law. And this is, I'm not talking about a policeman come up and tell you that. Sometimes you'll have just some monk say, he said, you can't be out of here, this is against the law. Well, that's what they say. Yeah. Yeah. I said, well, you know, I don't think it is. I'm on public property. Yeah, but you can't be out here yelling at people. I'm, I'm preaching, I'm raising my voice because to be heard. And it's not against the law what I'm doing here. In fact, uh, I gave a couple examples there of it. Uh, Ezra, remember where they came to Ezra? They had to stop uh, construction on the temple. They said uh, they, they got a, a, an ordinance from the king. He said, you got to cease this thing. He said, go back and look up the original ordinance under right. Cyrus, and you'll find what we're doing is perfectly legal. You all know a little bit about your uh, legal rights as well. If you're on public property, uh, there's no, you don't have to buy. You know, now sometimes the guy will tell you, you know, you got to get a permit to preach. Uh, I've had to tell you to tell me that. I've had to tell me you got to get a, a permit to uh, pass out tracks. And I went and talked to the chief of police. He said, no, you don't need any permit. And, and uh, they'll try and, you know, all kinds of things to, to do that. Uh, Amos was told that. Remember, he went down and preached in front of the, the king's court. They said, go somewhere else. They said, this is the king's court. This is the king's chapel. You can't preach here. And he said, well, I'm going to preach anyhow. So, uh, and of course, Ken's had several experiences down on Beale Street. They've tried to shut him down because, you know, you can't be here and you can't be there. Well, it was one year we started down there and they decided we couldn't have the poles for the banners because the poles were metal and they could be construed as a deadly weapon. Yeah. Of course, it was okay for them to serve beer in glass bottles that if you ever seen the guy pop on the end of one of those <laughs> off, use them for an operating tool. <coughs> Open somebody. If that was okay, but you couldn't have. It. So you will get that. But I'm talking about the just not the police, but just some people come up saying it's against the law. You can't be. Well, you just explain them. No, it's not against the law. I have a, and I've told people. You know, I, I got come by. Said, I wish I could be someplace where there wasn't no folks like you out here on the street preaching and all of that. I said, okay, I can take some places. Communist China. Communist Vietnam, North Korea, Cuba, uh, Saudi Arabia, all the places that forbid what I'm doing are not the kind of places that you want to live in. And the fact that you can come out and do a lot of the things you're doing is only because people like us come out here and we make the, the officials recognize that you have freedom of speech out there. And then I gave you a whole bunch of uh, Bible examples of public ministry, Enoch, Noah, Moses, Elijah, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Jonah, John the Baptist, the whole book of Acts. And Jesus is probably one of the greatest street preachers in the entire Bible. Almost everything he's doing is out public. You know, he's up there on the mountain. He's in, he, one place the crowd gets so big he has to get in a boat and move off a little bit so the folks can hear him project out across the water. Um, one place he's in a house there, and there's a big mob around there, and he's preaching and, and whatnot. And real group of things I've given you about why Christians do not do public ministry. Uh, they don't realize it's a biblical practice. I mean, there are Christians who never really stop talking about it. the whole book of Acts. That's all they're doing. They're out publicly out there uh, in the marketplaces. That's why I like uh, going to the mission field uh, in third world countries. They're 50 to 60 years behind us. We went last year to, to uh, Guatemala and going back again this year. The big square in front of the presidential palace is probably the equivalent of six, it's an open space, six city blocks. And there'll be at any time of the day 500 to 1,000 people in the building. We, we saw three 
they did while all of them was preaching there on that in that area while we were there. Uh, whereas America now has moved into the malls and whatnot where you can't always get to where the people people are. But uh, it is a biblical practice. Some of them don't uh, they don't know how to. And uh, that's why it's always I have always tried to bring somebody up here to Beale Street if I could. Or take folks out some of the street meetings we do down in Pensacola show kind of stuff. Uh, some of them are just afraid. Uh, so, you know, you stand down. I remember the first time I came up here in uh, 2000, and I hadn't really preached in this kind of setting. And when you look down Beale Street on Saturday night, it looks like there is almost you know, <coughs> wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder, you know, head to nose. Uh, you think, how am I even going to get through this crowd? And of course, if you get there, it's not quite as. But, you know, that is somewhat of an intimidating scene. And uh, folks are just fearful of doing it. And all I can tell you is, if you're fearful of doing it, it's just like the first time they told you to jump in the water and swim. You know, you finally have to jump in and do it. And uh, finally, the last one, they want to get along with people, mainly the world. A lot of folks are not going to get out there and do this because what are people going to say about me? I'm going to look like I'm done. I'm going to look like I'm on the Bible thumpers. And uh, again, hey, and you have that mentality today because this, this age, everybody wants to get along with everybody. You don't say anything ugly about anybody. You don't discriminate against anybody. You don't, you know, uh, you, you be kind to everybody. It's almost unheard of to uh, you know not like somebody because their uh, their race or their nationality or their uh, their sexual preference or you know so now it's you get along with everybody and when you're out down here or in your in your hometown standing there on the street corner and you are not getting along with everybody I mean there are a lot of folks who just don't so a lot of folks aren't going to for that reason. but you got a comment something like that. Yeah. Yes, I, I imagine, and you probably see more of that. Where, uh, okay, mom, it, all right for you adults to be out here, but you got your little ten-year-old out there. That that that's a, that's abusing that child. Uh, of course, it's all right if mom and daddy get drunk, and <clears throat> like you're talking about in the projects there, where I've seen that in other customers that I'm in, where, you know, they don't even know where they're staying that night. So, so, yeah, you will get that. How many of y'all have ever, ever been to a third world country to preach? Good. Yeah, you got, we did, I think we did 10 street meetings in six days down there last year. And like I said, you'll always have people stand around and they don't refuse. Give them a gospel track. Give them a, I've seen people give them a John Williams and see them walk over and sit down and open that up. And you can tell the look on their face what's going through their mind. This is predominantly Catholic country. Oh, this is the Bible that I've heard the priest talk about. Mm -hmm. First time he's ever seen it. Well, let's get ready to eat.